Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Switching to Online Exams in a Hurry. My name is Danny Shapiro, and I'm on the marketing team here at Hawks Learning. Our speaker today is Dr. Lewis Levy of Baker University. Dr. Levy is an Associate Professor of Mathematics and Chair of the Department of Mathematics, Physics, and Computer Science at Baker University. He received his BS in Computer Engineering from the University of Maryland at College Park in his MS and PhD in Mathematics from North Carolina State University. Dr. Levy utilized the Hawks platform for his College Algebra and Calculus 3 courses this spring. Jennifer O'Brien of Hawks, one of our course implementation specialists, is also joining us for the webinar today. She's here to help answer any questions throughout, so please enter those into the Q&A as we go, and we'll get to questions for Dr. Levy at the end. And on that note, I want to go ahead and hand it over to you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction, uh, and thank you to all of you for coming today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and talk a little bit about my experience. Uh, so, as you can see, I will be discussing switching to online exams in a hurry. Uh, so first, just a little bit of background. So, as, as you just heard, I'm a math professor at Baker University. Uh, we're a very small liberal arts university in Kansas. We have about 800 students on our main campus, uh, which is nice. It's a small, intimate uh, student population. Uh, but with that comes our ability to only offer about uh, one section of every math course, every low-level math course every semester. So every semester there's exactly one section of college algebra, one section of Calc 1, uh, and so on for the majority of our freshman, sophomore level courses. Uh, with that, that means that uh, I did not have really any colleagues that I could collaborate with in terms of specific course content for the courses I was doing when we all had to shift online very abruptly. Uh, fortunately, I do have a lot of great colleagues throughout the university and including in my department, uh, the other math people, uh, but we could more just talk somewhat of the generics, the generic points, because uh, like I said, I was the only one teaching the specific courses that I had. Uh, so that brought about a few challenges uh, with it. And like many of you, I suspect uh, you all had to transition to online courses in a real hurry, as did I. And there was a lot about moving my courses to online that I was really comfortable with. Uh, I've actually made video lectures before for students that were abroad or were sick or, or what have you. Uh, and so I was comfortable moving my lectures online. Uh, I was also comfortable with technology, a lot of the technology uh, facets around online learning uh, in general, except for exams. So I've used online homework tools before. Uh, I use a little bit of technology in the classroom, mostly just a computer and a projector when I wanna show images or graphs that are too hard to draw by hand. Uh, but in terms of a, a traditional online course or actually giving exams pencil and paper, uh, I'd, I'd never done anything other than paper and pencil for exams and quizzes before. I've only really done, uh, right, where students actually have to fill it in and I grade their handwritten work. So moving to online exams was entirely new for me. Uh, and and with the, the quick shift to online, uh, I felt a, a strong sense of urgency to figure out how to make this work uh, right away. Because in mid to late March, once we decided that the rest of the semester would be online, I had to figure out how to, how to make those early uh, April exams uh, accessible online and quizzes even sooner, which I think I delayed the first quiz while I took a little time to figure out what, what I was going to do. Uh, since we were mid-semester, and I wasn't planning for this to be an online course. Uh, I didn't really feel like I had much time to, to really go out there and look at options and learn new software and new online platforms. And so I knew that whatever I chose to use would need to be something uh, that I could be comfortable with pretty quickly. And at the same time, I didn't want my students investing a whole lot of time in, in learning new software or online platforms. Uh, I wanted them to spend most of their uh, schoolwork related time, uh, focusing instead on learning the math. And so I knew that whatever I used, I, I needed to be something that was a quick and easy learning curve for, for everyone that was involved. And so when Hawks first reached out to me and they said, well, how can we help you with your courses? I said, exams, that's, that's the one thing I haven't figured out how to handle. And they said, well, what, what are you looking for? And I sent uh, this bulleted list to them. These are all the things that I, that I really need. 
uh, when, I, when I wrote it the first time, it really sounded like a list of demands, to be perfectly honest. Uh, but perhaps a nicer way to say it is a wish list for things that I wanted. So uh, what I typically do when, when classes meet in person is I write all of my own exam questions uh, with, with the occasional exception here and there, but by and large, I, I write the vast majority of my own questions. Uh, I do it in LaTeX and I give students you know, paper exams and, and I grade their handwritten work. And I wanted to retain as much of this as I could when we moved to being online. So I, I told Hawks I wanted to be able to write my own questions. I want to be able to do it using LaTeX. And I, I'm aware that uh, software packages generally come with test banks. And so I'm, I'm glad to have a test bank there for me to use, uh, but I don't want to be entirely reliant on it. I want the option to write my own questions. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I don't know about you, but my time constraints were, were vastly different once we had to switch to being online. And I knew that that was the same for my students as well. You know, many of them might be at home with siblings that were also having all their classes moving online and there might be limited computer availability and internet usage. And so I didn't want to tell them, well, you have this exam on two at two o'clock on a Tuesday and that's the only time that it's available. Uh, instead, I wanted exams to be available for a few days. Uh, but I didn't want students to have a few days to work on them. I just wanted them to have the option of any time within that two to three day window uh, to, to take the exams. And so I wanted the exams to close an hour to 75 minutes after they opened it. Uh, this second to last bullet point, the two attempts just in case, uh, that was more for just in case there were technical issues, the internet went out. Uh, I didn't want to, to have a ton of emails coming at me with, you know, my internet flicked out and I can't, I can't get back to the exam because it's closed out. So I have the two attempts just in case. Uh, and finally on this slide, the most important thing was the quick uh, and easy learning curve, because uh, like I said before, I, I didn't want to invest a lot of my time or my students' time uh, in learning something new. And so in actually doing this, um, Hawks referred me to their question builder tool uh, within their, their larger platform, which can do a whole lot of things, but the question builder tool is where I put a lot of my focus, uh, because this is what allowed me to write my own questions in LaTeX. So, in doing this, I, I might have done things a little bit differently had this been an online course from the beginning. But since this was originally intended to be an in-person class, I wanted to make as few changes as I possibly could. Uh, lectures were as the same as they could be. Homework was as, as the same as it could be. Uh, but quizzes and tests, I wanted to, to, to mimic what would have happened in class as much as I could. Uh, and Question Builder really made that possible. Uh, and so I, what I would want to do next is actually take you over to Question Builder and show you what I did for my classes. So I used this for two courses, uh, for Calc 3 and for College Algebra. Uh, I'm going to show you Calc 3 first. Uh, I do want to start with just a, a blank question so you can get an idea of what this looks like. Uh, and then I'll lead you through a few examples of some of the very specific stuff that I really like to have for why Question Builder was really useful for me. Uh, so uh, suppose I tell the system I want to create a new question. So the first thing I need to type here is just the, the question statement. Uh, this is understood as plain text, right? So anything I type on the keyboard is going to show up exactly uh, as, as I type it. And if I want to actually insert some LaTeX code, uh, I, don't, I don't type it in dollar signs as I would in a LaTeX editor. Uh, instead, I need to tell the system that I'm going to be inserting LaTeX by clicking on this Expression Builder tool. And now anything that I type in this pop-up window, it's going to be interpreted as though it were LaTeX code, uh, as though it were surrounded by dollar signs. And you'll notice that as I type, once I get past this display style, uh, anything I type in the box here, uh, it's going to show me what it would look like if I were writing it in a traditional LaTeX editor and compiling it. Uh, so suppose I were to ask, say, a Calc 1 question. Suppose I were interested in the limit as x approaches 0 of the fraction, let's say, x squared plus 2x all over x. You'll see that what I've typed here in this box, the code portion, uh, it's giving me a preview of what that would look like in a PDF document so that I can make sure that it looks exactly the way that I want it to. Uh, generally, I would type my own code here, just like I would in a regular LaTeX editor. Uh, but there's a really nice feature that you do have some shortcuts to insert some code if you've forgotten it. 
So for example, if I wanted a natural log, I could, I could click this button and it would actually give me the code for LN. But anyway, back to uh, creating this question. When I click OK, it goes back to the question statement and it inserts the LaTeX here. Okay. I could keep typing and it's just regular plain text. If I want more LaTeX, I would go and click the LaTeX button again to insert new LaTeX code where my cursor is currently, uh, or I could double click on the code I've already written to modify what's there. All right, so suppose that this is the question that I want to ask. Well, there's a whole variety of ways uh, that you can ask for students to respond to questions. Uh, you'll see a whole bunch in this pull down menu. I primarily focus my attention on multiple choice, which is, is probably exactly what you're thinking, uh, versus free response, where students actually have to type in an answer. Uh, and so I want to show you both options, the two that I really focused on for answering this question. So if I want to make this a multiple choice question, uh, I do need to tell it what the answers are that I want people to, to select from. So suppose the first answer I want to give it is the correct answer. So I'll say that this first answer selection should be worth 100% of the credit. So you'll see it says that, okay, I understand it says your correct answer. Uh, I believe the answer to this limit is two. Uh, since two is, is just a number, I can just type it in this box as is. Uh, this is just considered as plain text. So I'm actually just getting a regular number two. If I wanted something a little bit more mathy, I could, actually, I could actually use the expression builder and actually type in something mathy if I wanted to, if x squared were, for example, an answer choice I wanted to have available. And so let me actually put the two here. So now I have the option of the plain text two versus the mathy two. I could use either one I like. All right, for a second answer choice, uh, let me just do this in plain text. Uh, a common answer that I've seen when I give questions like this before is just zero. And so let's leave that as an answer choice in plain text. Now, maybe I want to be nice and say, all right, well, students should receive 20%, 25% of the credit for this wrong answer. Uh, but as a multiple choice question, even though I have that option, I might not want to give my students any credit for selecting zero. But it's kind of nice that I have the option to give them some if I want to. Uh, another common response that I've noticed is students telling me that this limit does not exist when they get an indeterminate form like this. And so I want this to be a third answer choice uh, also worth no credit. All right, uh, I could pick a fourth answer choice if I want to, and I could add more. Right, you see the add another answer option. Uh, or I could select fewer. So I'm happy with just these three answers. So I'll hit this delete button so that I'm just left with three possible answer choices. Uh, I want to preview this so you can see what it looks like, but I will need to save it first. So this will be an example limit problem of low difficulty. Uh, now that it's saved, I can actually preview it. Uh, as you'll notice, this is an instructor view uh, because, I, of course, I'm not going to want students who are actually taking an exam or a quiz to, to know the point values of each of the answer choices. Uh, but you'll see that the way that the question statement looks is very, very LaTeX-ish, the way it would look if I were to actually put this in a PDF document. So uh, for a lot of my questions, uh, I would often write the first answer, uh, I would make the first answer the correct one worth 100% of the credit uh, because uh, you'll see all these unlock symbols here. Okay? This means that the order of the answer choices available are unlocked in the sense that they can display in any order. So for me, they're displaying in the order that I typed them. But when student A opens this question on an assignment, these three answer choices could appear in any order, uh, which is why I didn't feel the need to scramble them. When student B goes to open this, it might appear in a different order. Student C, a different order. Uh, but it is my understanding that when a specific student opens this question, even if they revisit it, it will continue to be uh, in the order that it was initially, initially presented to them. Uh, I do have the option to lock this order if, if I just really want to keep two as my first answer and does not exist as my last. Uh, but by default, uh, they could show up in any order. OK. So now that this question is in here, uh, it is available in my own personal test bank to use for uh, future exams. Uh, but let's say I wanted to ask the same question, but instead of multiple choice, I want students to actually type in a response. Uh, the, the easiest way that, well, the easiest way for me to do this was to just say, well, let's, let's consider this as a free response answer. And since now the computer needs to uh, understand and interpret what students type in, there is, uh, a lot more flexibility in terms of, of how you explain to the computer what your answer needs to be. 
For me, fortunately, many of the defaults here were exactly as I needed them. Uh, math was highlighted by default as opposed to text answers. Uh, this evaluate as more or less just refers to how the computer should understand the student's response. Uh, expression is on here by default and that generally works just very well for me. In terms of telling it what the answer is that I'm expecting, uh, you'll notice that there are all these symbols here because whatever I type in here is going to be interpreted as LaTeX. So uh, if I wanted the answer to be x squared, I would type x squared as though it were surrounded by dollar signs in a tech document. And x squared is right, the way that um, you would see in a PDF is what shows up down here. Okay, since the correct answer to this one is two, I will uh, just leave two here as the correct answer. Here's my mathy version of the number two, and this should be worth all of the credit. All right, so for most free response, right, since most math questions have one answer, or at least at this level, most have one answer. Uh, I'm, I'm happy with just a single answer choice most of the time, uh, but I do have the option to add another answer that I'm willing to accept. Let's do that here. And since this is a free response as opposed to multiple choice, suppose I do wanna give students the option of typing in zero for an answer to receive some of the credit. Okay, suppose I'm willing to give them 25% of the credit for typing in zero. Uh, I can leave this as an alternative answer uh, for the students that, um, that the system will mark as worth some amount of credit. All right, so let's uh, preview what this looks like, which means I'll need to save it first. Uh, I didn't need to fill out quite as much information as I did before since I'd already named the question and assigned a difficulty level. So here the question statement is exactly as uh, it looked before since I didn't change that. And you'll see that my answer options, there are two of them, uh, are just as uh, we had described before, right? Either answering two for all of the credit or zero for a quarter of the credit. Anything that students type in that is not on this list that I have provided uh, will receive no credit at all. And if I wanted to be generous, I do have the option for um, giving credit, either all credit or some credit for unsimplified answers. So if the answer were x squared, that's where uh, telling it to interpret, uh, telling it to interpret my answers uh, can be useful in that if a student types x times x, it will often understand that as uh, as x squared as well. If I'm willing to give partial credit for it. Okay. Uh, now that I've taken you through a blank one, uh, let me actually take you through uh, questions that I've already written. So, get back into my question bank. So when I teach Calc three. I really like to give uh, indeterminate limits like this one. So uh, this, you'll notice, is much more Calc 3 style since I have two variables. Uh, you'll notice this limit is indeterminate and in the numerator and denominator are both approaching zero. And this one actually has an answer of does not exist, but rather than just assigning this limit and asking my students to evaluate it as is, uh, I actually made this a multi-part question. You'll see here step one of five because I have five parts to this question where I actually ask students to evaluate very specific paths to the origin. And so if I scroll down just a little bit, uh, you'll see that the first question is find the value of the limit as you approach the origin along the x-axis. Uh, if you do that, if you approach the origin along the x-axis, you will get a, a value of one for this limit. Uh, part two is approach along the y-axis. This also produces an answer of one. Uh, similarly, along the line y equals x also produces an answer of one. Uh, trying to lead my students to notice that many of these paths to the origin all produce the same value, right, an answer of one. And so if this limit were to exist, based on the uh, information we've collected so far, the answer should be one. Uh, but then I threw in this other path, x equals y squared, where if you actually trace this path to the origin, uh, you get zero for the limit. And so I actually wanted to guide them through these series of different paths to the origin to to hopefully get them to conclude on their own that this limit should not exist, which I ask is my, my fifth and final point to this question. All right, uh, with that in mind, uh, for my final exam in this course, uh, I was mostly able to use the test bank to pick out questions I was very happy with, uh, but I did have a few very specific things I really wanted to ask the students. I don't know about you, but when I teach Calc 3, uh, the multiple integration, I, I feel like the, the setting up of the multiple integration problems or uh, 
uh, in some cases, the swapping of the order of integration is, is really the new skill that students are learning. And depending on the problem they see, the actual performing the integration as they would have learned in Calc 1 and 2 uh, can be very time consuming. And I don't always want them to invest a lot of time in that. I'm more interested in seeing, well, can you set up the integral? Because that's really the new thing I want you to do. Uh, and so here's an example uh, of a multiple choice question I gave of this form on the final exam. Uh, I asked them to compute the volume of this 3D solid, and I described this 3, 3D solid for them in rectangular coordinates, but I asked them to set up the triple integral that would correspond to this volume in, in spherical coordinates. And you'll notice I was, I was somewhat nice here and I provided the Jacobian for them, uh, and I did specify the order of integration I was interested in. And when I wrote this question, I, I gave my students a little bit of uh, warning ahead of time that if there were any multiple choice questions that they should work them out on their own, pencil and paper in advance, and uh, then just look at the multiple choice responses to look for the answers they already came up with. Uh, because you'll notice in a moment that I gave a lot of options for, for what might potentially fall in these bounds, many more than might normally be fair in a, in a regular multiple choice question. So in, in order to ask them to set this up, if this were a pencil and paper exam, I would just, right, I would just read off the six values that they had typed here, uh, maybe giving them a little bit of partial credit if they just swap things around a little bit. Uh, but I, you know, I would give, well, all the credit for the correct answers and maybe some if they just switched, say, the upper bound and the lower bound for a particular integral. All right, so I took them through this question as a six-parter, right? One part for each um, bound on the integral I'd left blank. So for this innermost integral, uh, the bound should be zero and two. You'll notice this is describing the sphere of radius two. And so uh, for the lower bounds, the answer should be zero, but I did wanna give some partial credit, say for the number two, you'll notice this is worth half the credit. If all they did was hopefully just swap the order of integration, or not the order, sorry, the, the bounds, uh, I wanted to give credit for that. Uh, similarly, when I asked about the upper bound, I realized that a sphere of radius two, well, right, the radius is squared on the right side of the equation. So I did wanna give a little bit of credit if they selected four, uh, but most of the other answers, especially the stuff with pi, uh, is likely uh, stuff that they would have gotten for the other variables, rho and theta, as they work through this. And so you'll see this six part question actually leads them through every single one of these bounds. And so forgive my scrolling a little bit too quickly to read it, but hopefully you can see that I'm just selecting a different bound for every one of these. Okay, uh, so as I said for Calc 3, I was mostly able to use the question bank, uh, but I did have a few very specific problem types that I really wanted to write myself. Uh, I did use uh, the question builder a lot more for my college algebra course. Uh, I don't plan to torture you with tons of questions on this one, but I do have uh, uh, more that I can show you in here. So I wanna take you through some of the questions that I've written for this class. So uh, one thing about my courses, I really like to grade some stuff by hand. I really like to, to actually give students written feedback on their written assignments. But when I get very large classes, uh, it can be hard to provide a lot of feedback. And so what I do is I usually give homework from the book every week, well, every day that class meets. Uh, but once a week, I provide a quiz for them over the previous week's assignments, all of the previous week's assignments. And in this quiz, uh, I give them a question directly from an assignment from the week before, and I actually tell them what the problem is, what the page number is, and so on, as you can see here. And I wanted to retain this to some extent when we moved our courses to be online. And so the question that you'll see here uh, actually appeared on, on a quiz over a previous week's homework assignment so that I could, I could keep that somewhat consistent with how we did things in person. But usually I don't give the students enough time to work the problems out start to finish, especially if it's something that they haven't been doing before, some, you know, a problem type that they're not familiar with because they're not keeping up with their assignments. But I do give them enough time to locate the problems in their notes if they're well organized so that they can quickly cop over their, copy over their work and their answer. Uh, so this is an example of that, why I said, this is question number 24 from this section in this page. Uh, so for this one, uh, this, this brings about a point of, of uh, question builder is something that I was a little bit less familiar with. Uh, I asked them to right, solve for x in this, in this equation. Uh, if you actually combine the logarithms and switch it to exponential form so that you get a quadratic equation, 
Uh, just looking at that quadratic equation is going to have two solutions, solutions of 4 and negative 25. Uh, but you'll notice that if you allow x to be negative 25, I'll scroll back up so you can see it, uh, that you would be taking logarithms of negative values, which I generally don't allow in a college algebra course. And so I wanted students to see that they need to throw out that answer. But at the same time, I did want to give some credit if they made it that far into the problem. So uh, just to be clear, this is a free response question. This is not a multiple choice. So students had to actually type in an answer for me. They were not selecting this from a list. And so if all they typed in was the number four, they received full credit for this. And if they were to type in four and negative 25, I did want to assign them half of the credit. Uh, but I did not know offhand if the computer would know that four comma negative 25 should be interpreted as the same solution as negative 25 comma four. And so rather than telling them list your answers from smallest to largest or whatever, uh, instead, I left both of these as, as possibilities. So either one of these that they typed, they would receive some credit for this, for this question. Okay. Uh, as one final example from, from Question Builder, I do want to show you a little bit of the final exam I gave. Uh, this college algebra class was somewhat large, and my final grades were due very soon after they were taking the exam, which normally I just grade paper and pencil in a hurry but I, I was not comfortable doing that online, grading very quickly in a short time frame, And so I gave an entirely multiple choice exam to this class uh, so that my turnaround time would be, would be practical to meet. And instead what I did was these multiple choice questions that I gave, so these are all multiple choice. You'll see that there's a lot of them in here. Uh, the numbering is mostly for my own record keeping and so that I could preserve the order that I wanted. Uh, there are some of these that are multiple parts, why you see a 19 and a 20 on this one. Uh, but largely, uh, these questions are very short. Uh, they should not take very much time to work, so that on the one hand, I can give them a lot of questions, uh, and on the other hand, none of them have to be worth uh, very many points. Uh, usually, I would give partial credit for solutions that, that have some truth to them, uh, but since that's difficult to do on multiple choice questions, even with the partial credit for some answers, uh, I just decided to give a lot of questions that were very short and of small point value. Uh, so just to take you through a few of these, um, let me give a reasonably easy one. So here just asking for the y-intercept. So here I gave them the equation of a line, scrolling down, and asked them to tell me what the y-intercept was. So this hopefully should not be very time consuming, uh, but I tried to not only give the correct answer, but but other answers that, um, that I generally see when I'm grading this stuff by hand. Uh, another example, so you'll notice this also looks kind of mean and then I have a lot of answer choices available. Uh, just asking for the domain of this logarithmic function. So the correct answer here is that x should be greater than 2 so that you're taking logs of positive values. But you'll notice I did make use of the uh, partial credit for wrong answers here. Uh, if students just said x is greater than or equal to 2, including taking the log of zero, which they're not allowed to do, as opposed to just x is greater than two. I did want to assign a little bit of credit for that, uh, but many of the other uh, common wrong answers that I see, uh, I was not willing to give partial credit for. Okay. Uh, you'll notice, as, as I showed you in the calculus course, uh, I was mean in giving a whole lot of answer choices. Uh, this was mostly because this is not what I would traditionally give as a multiple choice question. Instead, I would just want students to write x is greater than two on their paper. Uh, but rather than have them try and type that into the computer, I wanted to make it multiple choice, and so they should work it out on their own and then just select the correct answer from the list. Okay, uh, well that pretty much wraps up my portion. I, I don't want to torture you with too many more examples, but of course if you have questions that, that would make it appropriate for me to go back to that, I'd be happy to do so. Uh, thank you very much for coming today, and uh, I'll, I'll stick around for a little longer. Thank you very much, Dr. Levy. Um, we already have a number of questions coming in. I know Jen has been in the background addressing a lot of questions, so thank you, Jen, and we'll have her give a little bit of a rundown um, to some of the more general questions, but I want to make sure we address some of the points in your presentation first. Um, John was hoping um, you could show a little bit of the use of the question bank and if you might be able to, to um, talk about how you use that or jump in there and show an example of how you add a question from the question bank in addition to the questions you've built on your own. Oh, sure. Uh, so that'll take a few more steps because I actually need to have an assignment to add it to. 
Uh, I can, oh, uh, but you need to see my screen in order to be able to do this. Uh, so uh, let me share my screen again. So uh, I may have an old assignment that I can use. Uh, if not, I can create one pretty quickly. Uh, so here we go, practice quiz. So uh, once I'm actually in an assignment, either that I've created in advanced or that I'm editing as I'm doing now, uh, on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see the quiz as it's been as it's being created, so there's already a question in here. Uh, I have the option of choosing from, here we go, if I click on Hawks, let me make sure I do this right. Uh, here I'm going through Hawks's calculus textbook. Uh, so starting pretty general and then I can select which chapter I want. So suppose I wanna give an integration question, uh, something on the definite integral. Uh, I have a lot of questions to choose from. Uh, suppose I wanted to select this one, number three, uh, I have the option, if I click add, it moves over to the right side of the screen. Uh, I can change the number of points that it's worth here uh, or after it's already been added to the test uh, and a few other options if I want to do that. Uh, if I also wanted to include one of my questions, uh, you'll notice up here in question bank, instead of picking uh, Hawks, the test bank that's already here, I also have the instructor option where I can pick, say, that extra final exam question I showed you. If I can get into there. Here we go. Uh, so you'll see here's the six part question on the triple integral that I gave as an example. I have the option to add this to the quiz over here on the right uh, for however many points I want. Uh, I can't choose the number of points here because I've specified the points on every step. And I can change that here or once it's added to the quiz. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, we're getting even more questions in, so we'll just keep it rolling here for um, the, your test that you gave, you mentioned that there were um, two attempts and we had a question asking if those two attempts were each given 60 to 75 minutes or if that was the total time for two attempts. Oh, so each attempt started its own clock. So they'd have 60 to 75 minutes for each attempt. Uh, the only time there might be an exception to that is if they start an attempt too soon to when the assignment closes. So if the assignment closes at noon on Wednesday, uh, regardless of whether they're in the first attempt or the second attempt, if they started a, the assignment at 11.30 and it closes at noon, they only have half an hour. But assuming that there's plenty of time in the window, they have the full 60 to 75 minutes for every attempt. And Gary asks if you can define your own LaTeX macros or um, in order to use along, uh, with this question builder. So I kind of wondered if this question was gonna come. Uh, I'm not sure uh, what libraries are included or how one would insert macros. And so I, I'm gonna have to defer to the expert on that one. I'm actually, I don't know that you do have the ability. I'm actually not that familiar with LaTeX. Um, so I don't think there's anything you can define regarding that within Hawks. Uh, in case it's useful though, I do know when you open Expression Builder, it does have a few different buttons you can select in order to, for instance, you know, type, if you click the fraction button, then it will pre-populate the coding needed for um, LaTeX in order to enter a fraction. Is that what a macro is for LaTeX? I wasn't quite sure what a macro was. So um, Gary, we will have um, somebody follow up with you with that um, again, because we're so we apologize that none of us can answer that specific question for you. Um, but we do have experts that have built this function uh, and we'll make sure to get with them and provide you a specific answer um, to make sure that um, you know all the functionality that this tool can provide for you. Um, we had another question uh, asking if you've used web work and if so, uh, why did you choose Hawks instead of web work? Uh, so I have used web work. Uh, that's, that's actually often what I use for online homework, uh, in part because of the, the no cost to my students. Uh, I thought about doing that for exams, uh, but, uh, but I, I don't know, I was very hesitant because I would have felt like I had to have it only open for an hour or two and students had to do it in that time interval, uh, that they couldn't have several days uh, to use it. Uh, the other thing is we host web work ourselves on our own server and it works great 99% of the time, uh, but even small power flickers take it off and we need to reboot. 
And without people on campus uh, around the clock like we normally have, uh, I had too much potential for failure. And so I, I didn't want to take that chance. Uh, had the MAA been hosting it for us, I would have felt a little bit more confident with that. Uh, but at the same time, like I said, I wanted there to be a few days window where students could take it. Uh, and if web work can do that, um, I, I don't have experience with that, um, other than just limiting the length of the assignments available overall. Did you ever use the show work feature alongside some of your questions? Uh, so I didn't. I learned about it maybe about two or three weeks into when I started using Hawks and, and I thought about it, uh, but I, I never, I never took the leap. Um, I did have sh students show me their work on, on non-multiple choice uh, problems, uh, but this uh, pretty low tech. I just had them take pictures either with their phone or scan it with their computer uh, and send it to me, either, either dropping the files into, uh, into Moodle or sending them to me by email. So uh, no, I didn't use the service through Hawks, but I, I did grade work by hand. Jen, can you talk just a little bit more about how that feature works with our system? Sure. So with our show work option, you can turn it on for any individual question. Um, and as of right now, the functionality allows students to type using a keyboard. So um, right now, I think a best practice would be using it if a student's going to explain where, uh, how they got to an answer, but maybe not necessarily typing out the specific math for it. Our second or updated version of it, we do plan to have an upload option, which would be similar to um, what uh, it sounds like you're doing in your class right now, where students are just uploading their work from their scrap piece of paper. So that will be coming, but it is not out currently. Dr. Levy, for free response, um, if questions don't reach the, uh, if students don't reach the final answer, did you have a way um, for them to give them partial credit or have them submit some partial answer there? Uh, so not as well for the multiple choice, but I think you said the free response. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, so I did, like I said uh, a moment ago, I'm guessing you asked before the last question. Uh, I did have them turn in all of their work. And so uh, after an assignment was completed, I would actually go through their questions, even the ones that were marked correct. And I would compare it with the work that I saw and I could adjust all the credit that was assigned. And so, in particular for some of the very hard questions where there was very little or no work to support it, I would actually change the answer from full credit to, to very little uh, if, if the students couldn't support what they had. So perhaps not the most ideal way, but, but yes. And within the question builder tool, there is also an option to turn on the option to accept unsimplified answers and then the instructor could choose how to grade those as well. Um, and if you find that students are putting in uh, a regular um, or regularly putting in an answer that's not correct, uh, I don't know if this is exactly answering this question, but if there is a common wrong answer for a free response question, you can also put in that incorrect answer and give partial or no credit, similar to um, what you mentioned with the multiple choice at the beginning, you'll put in some of those common wrong answers. Um, so that is also an option with free response. Our next question is wondering if you kept the same time parameters for quizzes and tests that you would have given in class as you did online. Uh, so I gave just slightly more time uh, in class. If, if uh, the class period is ending, I'm usually willing to give students an extra 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, that's about what I provided for, for the online version. Uh, since I realized there might be a little bit of a learning curve for the students just with getting acquainted with the software, um, hopefully just a small one. Uh, I did have some very small practice low stakes assignments to start with. So their first quiz or two was just a very easy math question where they had a lot of time to, to do it and they had very many attempts uh, before I had the more, the more real assignments where they actually had to do some work. So, so no, the timing was the same. Sorry to give a long answer to a short question. Uh, but the timing was about the same, just a little bit more. Uh, but I made sure that they had some practice with with assignments that, that wouldn't really impact their grade before they uh, before they had something where time would be critical. And can you talk about the time investment on your end needed to make a, f a full test such as the 35 question final that you showed there? Uh, so for that one, I'd actually used that once before. There was, uh, I almost never give multiple choice exams, uh, but I had, not to walk you through all the logistics, but 
from the time the exam ended to the time grades were due, uh, if you subtract out all the graduation requirements that I had to attend, I had maybe two hours to get everything done. And so uh, I'd actually written the multiple choice question already for a previous exam. And so uh, I just had to, for lack of a better term, code them up. Um, I did it in maybe about three sittings that were 20 to 30 minutes each. So maybe about an hour and a half to write it, uh, since I actually had to do, write all the LaTeX code for that, uh, which was not as bad as it could have been. Maybe about as long as it would have been to, if I'd already had the questions written to actually type it into a PDF or to a LaTeX editor. We have two questions here asking about the um, algorithmic, algorithmically generated options available. Um, and so did you use any of those in order to um, create multiple variants of the same type of question? So I didn't. Um, I, I knew that that was a possibility and I thought about it, um, but I didn't end up using it. Given a little bit more time, I might have might have taught myself that feature also. Um, I saw a webinar that, it, that talked about it. And so I, I, I seriously considered it, but I didn't quite make the leap. Jen, do you have anything that um, you want to add in on those uh, algorithm algorithmically generated iterations? Yes, so you do have the option, whether it's multiple choice or free response, to create uh, multiple versions of a question. And the way that you would do that is through our variable manager. And so you're essentially coming up with each of the different versions of the question. So it takes a little bit of time to establish, but once it's done, then it's good to use from there on out. And of course, the benefit of that, rather than just putting in ranges for the values to randomly populate, um, is you have a lot more control over exactly what each version of the question will, will look like so that you're maintaining um, you know, this, a similar level of difficulty for each student. And Dr. Levy, um, how did you handle cheating? Is there anything that you did to uh, deter that? We, we know we hear concern from um, instructors about math apps and um, other issues of um, dealing with integrity. Uh, well, I don't know how well I deterred it. Uh, I, I, hope, I hope I discouraged it. I originally wasn't going to ask students to turn in their work, uh, but then, then I decided it was probably in my and their best interest to do so. Uh, so, um, no, I didn't do this very well. Um, I, I hope that turning in their work helped deter it somewhat, uh, but, you know, for all I know, right, their, their siblings were filling it out for them or they were using Mathway or, or something else. Um, on top of that, I did use the lockdown browser for exams. I don't believe I used it for quizzes, uh, which is much better than not using a lockdown browser uh, so that assuming that students don't have other devices where they can look things up nearby, uh, they can't do anything on the computer other than take the exam while they're in the exam. They can't take screenshots, they can't use the calculator uh, un unless there's one provided on the exam itself. Um, I had a lot of colleagues that actually did um, had their students uh, take exams with webcams so that they could actually proctor and make sure it was actually them and make sure that they were finished when they were finished. Uh, so I, I perhaps did not do it as well as some of my colleagues, but I was also not comfortable asking all my students to, to have webcams on during the exams. Our next question uh, is from Judy, who asks if you can modify test bank questions. I don't know. I'm going to have to defer for to Jen on that one. So we do not have the ability to modify existing Hawks or to let in instructors modify the existing Hawks question bank. Uh, but that's something where, you know, we always ask that you communicate with us if there is a specific change you're wanting in a question type. It's possible that's something that we believe would benefit another school as well. Um, we do actually have a team called the Customer Love Team dedicated exclusively to addressing content needs for schools. Um, so we are able to help a lot if we need to build in a new question or something like that for you. Um, we can't say we can definitely do every single question for every single school, but we really do our best to try to address uh, needs for schools when it comes to question bank uh, requests like that. Thank you very much to you both. Excuse me for a minute, just as I scroll through, we continue to get a ton of questions. And I know we're running short on time, so I want to make sure we um, answer any other points. Jen, I'm wondering if you can um, give us a quick breakdown of some of the questions you answered in the chat that would be applicable to everyone while I check out the remaining questions in the question and answer section. 
Sure. So let's see. One question somebody asked is whether or not um, you're able to lock an individual multiple choice answer order. So if you want the last or the first one to always say all, or sorry, shoot, the example was if you want the last multiple choice answer to always be all of the above, um, and you are able to do that. So you can lock individual orders and of course the order of every multiple choice answer if you want to. Um, somebody had asked if you're able to use a stylus as a student to put in the answer since it would be tedious to use law tech for a student to answer the questions. Uh, but the good news is students do not actually have to type it in in that format. They're, the students are just going to use the uh, keyboard and then we have a built in math keypad that makes it really easy for answer entry. So a stylus answer um, option is not available. Um, let's see. And Danny, feel free to chime in too here as I'm going through. Um, another question, can you change the decimal accuracy? Uh, and you do have that option. So there's an advanced option selection that gives you then the ability to change the decimal accuracy if you want. Let's see, we already answered show work. Um, somebody did give a helpful website if some, anyone's interested in learning more about how to use LaTeX. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correct, even LaTeX or LaTeX, uh, but it's www.tug.org, they mentioned, is a good, um, a good option for that. Somebody else asked if an answer is an expression, will equivalent expressions be accepted? And the system is by default designed to accept any correct version of the answer. However, if as an instructor, you're not wanting that, you're really wanting to lock it down to just one specific uh, version of the answer to be selected, you can restrict it by um, either changing the evaluation type, but more, more likely by restricting what characters can be accepted. So you can uh, make sure students can only put certain answer entries in. Okay. Um, That's most. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Jen. And I see we do still have a number of questions, um, but I know again, we're running out of time for the end of today. Um, we will download your questions from the, the Zoom bank um, go through them and make sure to write you back email answers. A lot of them are about the, the functionality of question builder um, that, that we can have our representatives work with you on and help you fully understand everything that the tool can do. Um, so Dr. Levy, I want to thank you again for um, showing off how you use this tool um, and for speaking with us and our audience today. Um, My pleasure. Audience, thank you very much for attending. We appreciate um, your very engaged Q&A session. So Thank you for all the questions. We did record this and we will be emailing you a link to the recording. Um, we'll also include in that email a link to the webinar we did about the variable manager and how to use that tool as well. If you're interested in seeing a little bit more about that, you can reach us at marketing at hawkslearning.com if you have any questions. Um, and thank you to Jen as well for being here. So I hope everyone has a great rest of their day.